Next Leap, an Iron March publication. Racial Hierarchy by Alexander Slavros. It would appear that some people take issue with the idea of racial hierarchy where everyone fulfills their role, as if that is something degrading or insulting to one's race. That if someone were to view their own race as inferior, it would be bad. Not sure how this issue can arise in the first place, considering we're all racists here and seem to be on the same page about group stereotype and individual merit, but I'll highlight this once again. What does justice call for? Equality or inequality? Our answer is resoundingly the latter. As with any truth, this one projects itself onto all matters of life. Just as there are inferiors and superiors in a given race, there exists a likewise balance among the races. Our goal in a given society is the organic state where everyone finds where everyone find their station where everyone finds their station and we see nothing degrading in someone being dedicated to a vocation that is lower than the concerns of the superior ranks. They are all still members of the nation and race. They contribute to the overall preservation of truth and thus are just as important, but they cannot fulfill higher functions. It would seem that nobody has issues with this, yet when the same principle is projected onto race relations, there were some uncertainties. Perhaps the issue is just with the, world inf with the word inferior. Well, fine, call them lessers if that helps you, but this sort of thing stinks of political correctness. The terms inferior and superior are relative, not qualitative, though they deal with a point of quality that is the axis for their relation. Saying a given race is inferior means it does not come up to the standard of that point of, e of quality that once reached determines a race as superior. Another consequence of this is how we treat individuals that belong to either an inferior or superior race. Think of it in terms of placing an individual to a backdrop of his race. We all agree on American niggers being scum at large. That is our backdrop. But when we talk to an individual representative of the race, we deal with him in regards to what happens once we consider that backdrop. If he blends in with the backdrop, if he blends in with the backdrop, would be lifted up from that process. Huh. But their large majority would be servile with a conditioned backdrop in mind that accounts for them enjoying a new standard that has been brought, brought about by the presence of a superior race. There would still be exceptional cases, but those would appear, again, only because of the presence of the superior race and it enforcing its own system. A similar thing exists on an ethnic-slash-national level, as well as in the sense of there being empire-building nations and peripheral nations that would belong to such empires. Russian Empire consisted of a variety of ethnicities that actually benefited even culturally from the pretense of the Russian nation as an empire-builder. Certain ethnic groups from a lesser place came to develop their own alphabet and subsequently great literature and poetry. So if this racial hierarchy implies benefits, no matter how you look at it, then what is exactly the problem? From a society where there are higher and lower castes that exist in organic harmony and find fulfillment in pursuing their own respective truths, to empires and peripheries that exist in symbases, in symbiosis and, and benefit each other, to a racial hierarchy where certain races guide others with all the same principles in place as in the previous two examples? This also means that yes, there can be non-Aryan fascists, there can be Negro fascists, but only because they seek to fulfill the truth and not scurry for mere interests. There can be non-Aryans that we treat as better comrades than some people of our own race. It doesn't imply self-deprecation or self-loathing, but the exact opposite. Most likely the issue comes from there not being a clear-cut chart of this hierarchy that would show exactly which race belongs where, and thus people start making assumptions that may not actually reflect this vision. This is something to consider and work on. What the heck? Okay. My settings were a little messed up there. Use this as a... The next article is The Lemming Principle by Zager. 
There's an concept, explained by various fascist sources, which is important to understand if we're going to be effective in propaganda, in activism, and ultimately in rulership. It's a fundamental aspect of human nature that has a massive impact on how our society functions, yet it's barely, if ever, discussed in modern circles outside of fascists. Two survival strategies, two kinds of men. In order to understand why people behave the way they do, it's important to know what's most important to them. Sure, a large part of that is in culture, in their religion, in their worldview. But there's a kind of deeper biological and instinctive part of that too, which I would call the survival strategy of a man. There are two different strategies. The first, most common by far, is social in nature. Humans, as animals, cannot survive alone in nature. They need to be part of a group. Being excluded from their group means death. For the social human, the absolute first priority, which overrides all other considerations, is to maintain their place in the group, to protect their status, to avoid being outcast. Anything which threatens to make them disliked by their group will frighten them at a primal level, a fear similar to a fear of death. So, for example, if the group has a traditional hunting technique, which is sacred, the social humans of the group would aggressively reject any in innovation. In fact, they would shun anyone who would dare to try hunting differently, fearing that they would be associated with the deviant and outcast along with them. It's important to note that this is not a calculated, conscious strategy. It's an almost subconscious emotional response. This is a very good survival strategy, which ensures that the social human will thrive within the group and help maintain the traditions of the society. At least 90% of humans are like this, at least in whites. The second strategy, much rarer, is more primitive and less... Oh great, now I can't scroll down to the next page. Good lord. The second strategy, much rarer, is more primitive and less... effective at maintaining the person's place within the group. It's based on seeking survival advantages by better understanding the environment and adapting, their, and adapting their behavior accordingly. The individualist human still wants to remain in the group, but he lacks the fear response when something threatens it. This gives him a much greater tendency for independent thinking and innovation, but also a much greater chance of being outcast from his group for the same reason. You could say that the independent thinkers simply fail to evolve the social reflexes normal humans have. The independent thinker experiences opposite emotional reactions when coming upon unorthodox knowledge. He feels excitement because it's an opportunity to earn a competitive advantage over nature and over, and over the other humans. Less than 10% of humans are like this. Disclaimer. First, it's important to immediately dispel some misconceptions about these two, these two groups. Social humans are not less intelligent than independent thinkers. It's just that the social types use their intelligences to maintain the group's orthodoxy, rather than to explore alternatives. A genius-level social person will have great skill in justifying why an old and disproved idea is good and valid, if it's popular. The independent thinker uses his intelligence to find the most useful ideas, the ones with the best evidence. The social types can, in fact, be part of revolutionary groups, or groups with very unconventional ideas. Social humans adapt to the people close to them, the ones who have power and authority in their field. In our huge societies, they form smaller groups and social circles with their own standards of thought and behavior. Thus, no specific idea can be pinned to either social or independent thinkers. The difference is in the survival strategy. It is basically impossible for social thinkers to understand that they are social thinkers. It is also impossible in general to tell social and independent types apart with brief conversation. The only way to distinguish them is in their emotional reaction to unconventional ideas. One will get angry or disturbed by mere exposure, while the other will show excitement and curiosity. Why this matters? You can go your whole life without noticing this difference, because it's somewhat hidden, even from independent thinkers. However, the implications in terms of politics are enormous. Here are a few of these implications. The average person is far more afraid of being outcast from their group than of any external threat. They can't help it. If fighting against an obvious and imminent threat will risk their position or reputation in the group, they will never do it. Indeed, they will never even think to do it. It's impossible to propagate unpopular ideas in a mass of people. 
if they feel that the people around them despise those ideas. Arguments are meaningless, because nothing can get rid of the fear reaction when dealing with taboo ideas. Inversely, you can convince social types of anything, no matter how absurd, if they believe that people around them also have the same opinion. If those in positions of authority strongly disapprove of the opposite idea, then this will trigger the fear of being outcast and the social type will affirm without hesitation that the sky is green and the ocean is red. Any group of people composed of social types that is left to itself without interference will maintain its traditions and standards of behavior very rigidly because they all fear being seen as different from the group. Even the leader will fear adopting drastic reforms and thus change is very slow. Since television can artificially create a notion of public opinion, those who control it can override the ideas and values even of the people around the social human. Propaganda aimed at the masses will be utterly ineffective if those masses do not believe you have the social power to outcast them. In other words, if they believe you are a fringe movement. This is true even with propaganda of the highest quality. The minority of independent thinkers, however, can be reached by well-conceived propaganda, even if social pressure would normally discourage them from adopting the desired opinion. Thus, the support of a majority of the population is an indicator of success, not a prerequisite of success. The majority will support you when it becomes fashionable to support you, and not before. The real victory can thus only be secured before that, when the movement only has a small fraction of the population behind it. True political power is the power to decide what is good and what is evil, according to the standards of the group. Many social types will rather die than act in a way that would threaten their status and position in the group. This is one of the mechanisms behind the social justice warrior's suicidal empathy. The aristocracy of a people is normally composed of the independent thinkers, since these, excuse me, since those are the people who can think beyond the norms of the group and make unconventional decisions when necessary. There are many other implications of this in all areas of life, from science to government or academia, but I think you get the general picture and can figure out the rest easily. Conclusion This is a notion every fascist should be familiar with. William Pierce called this the lemming principle, inspired by the small animal which runs off a cliff by following other lemmings around it. I imagine most of the Iron March community were already acquainted with this, as it's already implied or stated in different sources, but since this concept was not defined explicitly anywhere, I decided to clarify it. The Burden of Leadership by Zager The concept of leadership is crucial to fascism, because the cosmic order implies a hierarchy and this requires that the superior rules over the inferior. The greatest good, the most perfect harmony, is only possible when good men take on the burden of leadership. However, beyond this, there are practical difficulties in leading others and taking decisions. Here are my thoughts on the principles of temporal leadership. Swig. Life is suffering. Siddhartha Gautama, Gautama, better known as Buddha, said that existence is perpetual suffering. He went on to say that the only way to avoid suffering is detachment, which is to say, to stop giving a damn about everything around you. Not very fascist. However, his point was essentially correct. There's a steady amount of suffering in the world, and nothing we do will reduce it. All we can do is shift suffering around, transform it from one form to another, from one person to another, from one moment to the next. Eating candy will make you forget your worries for a moment, but there will be pain later when your teeth rot out. Stealing bread to alleviate your hunger will make the victim suffer instead. Borrowing money to buy a car will burden your future self with crushing financial obligations. Laying comfortably on a soft bed all day will make your muscles and bones atrophy and cause you great harm later. Keeping your body fit and trim requires suffering in the gym. But rather than lamenting all this pain, we as fascists simply accept it as part of life, and acknowledge that it is a positive and constructive force. Pain is nature's way of telling us that we're screwing up something and that we need to change our ways. 
Pain gives us motivation. Pain gives us energy. Pain whips us up when we're down and forces us to grit our teeth and carry on. The absence of pain means death or degeneration. The leader as arbiter of sacrifices. All human actions cause suffering and destruction in others. We kill animals and plants to survive. We crush insects and plants with every step we take in nature. Just breathing kills countless microorganisms. The same is true for all life in the universe, not just humans. And it is even more true as beings arise in the political hierarchy. As someone commands more and more people, their every act will have great influence over others, and thus have even greater potential to cause pain. This is inevitable. The special burden of a leader is that he must consciously decide who will suffer and who will be spared by his initiatives. Every law that gets adopted will penalize certain people for the benefit of others. A law to protect the environment will penalize the people of today for the benefit of future generations. Ugh. A law to stop smoking in public will make smokers suffer to spare non-smokers the annoyance of the smoke. A law to conscript men for war will sacrifice the young males for the benefit of women, children, and the elderly. Labor laws make business owners suffer for the benefit of their employees. There is obviously no such thing as a decision that will benefit everybody. However, it's possible to ensure that the brunt of the suffering will be felt by people outside the group, gang, nation, race. To be a leader means that those under your authority trust you to make decisions that will make the group suffer less, which is to say that you will export the pain outside the group. And people will trust and admire a leader who keeps his priorities straight. Being a leader. In my definition of fascism, I explained the difference between worldviews and ideologies, being that one is a direction, while the other is a method of getting there. In the same way, people expect two things from you as a leader that you're taking them towards a clear goal, an ideal they can all dream of and be inspired by, and second, that you manage them on the way there. The average person is just as cowardly as the liberals making stupid decisions for us today. They don't have the will to sacrifice others for their benefit, even if those others are foreigners, enemies, or worthless criminals. But make no mistake, they'll love you and follow you if you do, not, if you do it for them. Even at the level of a group of friends, Sharp leadership makes everything smoother. For example, imagine five guys are planning a road trip. If there's no leadership, there's going to be endless conflicts. Where do they go? Who pays for what? Who gets to sit where? Who drives them? Inevitably, the result will be arguments resulting in some shaky compromise where everyone is bitter and secretly frustrated. But what if one of them firmly decides everything? Then the friends won't be bitter because all the blame over the success or failure of the trip rests over the leader. Even if the leader makes poor decisions, the other friends will still be relieved that someone else took responsibility. Of course, the decisions made certain of them of course, the decisions made certain of them suffer more than others. But this is now irrelevant because the pain was now a necessary part of the package. They could take it or leave it, but they can't grumble that they should have pushed harder during the argument to get their way. Leadership is inherently valuable. Taking responsibility for making hard decisions is a great relief for others. Making good decisions is even more valuable. But even if you make subpar decisions, there's, that's still a lot better than anarchy or democracy, which is, the dis, which is the default in any social situation when leadership is absent. So, as a fascist, put your neck on the line. Step up and tell people what to do. They'll never thank you for it, but they will love you for it. Castes and Vocations by Alexander Slavros To cherry-pick a bit of your article concerning the castes of scholar and warrior, in the crisis of the modern world, Rene or Rene Guénon writes, The higher cannot proceed from the lower, because the greater cannot proceed from the lesser. In this context, this means that the superior, fascist, man must by nature be a scholar, the greater, the first caste, and after that he may be a warrior, even though he does not have the nature of a warrior. It is not possible for warriors by nature to become transcendent in the same way as scholars by nature may do so because caste, in its traditional meaning, is nothing other than individual nature, with the whole array of special aptitudes of special aptitudes that this carries with it and that predisposes each man to the fulfillment of one or other particular function of one or another particular function 
which you mentioned when you said, not everyone are cut out to be warriors and not everyone should be. Though man may by nature be a scholar, he can be a warrior if, as you were saying in regards to the greater war, he fights for spiritual principles. Gwenon has this to say, this is why, we say again, a true understanding can come only from above and not from below, and this should be taken in a twofold sense. The work must begin from what is highest, that is, from principles, and descend gradually to the various orders of application, always keeping rigorously to the hierarchical, hierarchical dependence that exists between them, and it must also of necessity be the work of an elite in the truest and most complete meaning of this word. By this we mean exclusively an intellectual elite, and in reality there can be no other. Qui ut deus? I'll have to introduce some corrections. First off, you're proposing a premise that fascists are only members of the, of the one caste. That is wrong. Fascists are those who fight against the modern world for the restoration of truth, My settings are so messed up, I can't even scroll to the next page. I have to find it on the sidebar. Fascists are those who fight against the modern world for the restoration of truth in temporal matters, but they can come from any spiritual caste, or even race for that matter, so long as they fight for the restoration of truth regarding their status in the racial hierarchy, regardless if they are somewhere or somewhere up or somewhere down on it. A serf can be fascist so long as he upholds his nature and truth and enforces it towards others. Like how in ancient caste societies, if someone from the superior caste tried to do the work of the lower castes, he'd be shunned as a pariah, not just by those of the superior caste, that is to say his equals, but also by those in the inferior castes, who would see it as an affront to themselves as much as to the whole truth that someone is attempting to act however he wants, regardless of his truth, because that makes him a liar in the deeper sense of the word. Fascism is merely the latest term used to describe our struggle and those who want to adhere to the truth. Fascism does promote the creation of the superior man, but that comes about from the adherence to one's truth, including racial truth, rather than from making all men into scholars. That being the other problem with your premise, you imply that the only fascists in a fascist society would be the ruling class, or you are implying that everyone would be brought into the fold of the superior caste, which would be another affront to the truth as a form of egalitarianism. Next, nowhere is it implied that warriors cannot transcend, because the relationship of the upper castes is very close, and they are the only castes imbued with spiritual force behind them. If anything, the real difference seems to be that the superior caste is entirely comprised of people who had already achieved transcendence, Whereas the warrior caste is people with the unrealized potential for that, unless you're implying there being different types of transcendence, which I have also not seen any evidence to. Transcendence is only described as either complete or incomplete, but not different. There are different paths to transcendence, but they are given in those two archetypes, which in themselves symbolize the two higher castes. None of this denies that the higher cannot proceed from the lower, from below, which is indeed one of the central pillars of our worldview. However, the complete relationship of the divine royalty and warrior castes is not so cut and dry. By scholars, I mean those with knowledge of eternal spiritual principles, truth, and my interpretation of fascism is that it is a manifestation of the truth. And so fascists would be scholars in that sense. I was being too optimistic when I thought that a fascist society could exist with only the first and second castes, as obviously there can be no rulers without a ruled. A society couldn't exist if everyone was of the same or similar nature slash caste. I was not implying that there are different kinds of transcendence, but that scholars wield spiritual authority, while warriors wield temporal power, to use Gwinnon's terms. Gwinnon posi posits that temporal power is delegated by spiritual authority. Essentially that the warrior castes, kings and nobles, only hold power because the scholars and their spiritual authority allow them to. Gwinnon has the idea, in the light of the cyclic theory of the world, that the modern day revolt the mass... Gwinnon has the idea, in the light of the cyclic theory of the world, that the modern day revolt of the most inferior against the superior began when the Kshatriyas, Kshatriyas, warrior caste, 
revolted against the Brahmins, intellectual caste, in prehistory. It is a question of a struggle of, for supremacy, a struggle invariably arising in the same manner. Having first been subject to, this, to the spiritual authority, warriors, the holders of the temporal power, revolt against this authority and declare themselves independent of all superior power. Even trying to subordinate to themselves the spiritual authority that they had originally recognized as the source of their own power, and finally seeking to turn the spiritual authority to the service of their own domination. This alone should suffice to show that in such a revolt there must be a reversal of normal rep relationships. Gwenon did not believe that Kshatriyas could transcend like Brahmins. Those who are made for action are not made for pure knowledge, and in a society constituted on truly spiritual bases, each person must fulfill the function for which he is really qualified. Otherwise, all, his, all is confusion and disorder and no function is carried out as it should be, which is precisely the case today. He believed that the Kshatriyas had to rule temporarily. Oh my god. I have no idea how how this is even happening. Temporarily, he believed that Kshatriyas had to rule temporarily or in government. Okay, there's the page. By the next recording, I'll have that fixed. That's freaking annoying. As it is their nature to do and do well. But the Brahmins are superior to them, as spiritual authority trumps temporal power. The royal Kshatriya function includes everything that in the social order constitutes what is properly referred to as the government. As for the priesthood, Brahmin, its essential function is the conservation and transmission of the traditional doctrine, in which every regular social organization finds its fundamental principles. Qui ut que qui ut Deus. Oh man, let me pour some more coffee real quick. The essence of our argument. So this is the person Alexander was <clears throat> corresponding with. Now this is back to Slavros himself in response. The essence of our argument is Gwenon versus Evola, really, and they do have their points of friction. But we're in sync on the roles of the royal divinity and warrior castes. About Gwenon's position as to the fall of the royal divinity, I rather agree with Evola's point here that the royal divinity caste first degenerated which led to the rise of the warrior caste against it, and after a while it degenerated as well as leading to the uprising of the lower caste. It's the same process but not introduced via revolt as the or origination of involution but via degeneracy. And if warriors couldn't transcend there, wouldn't be assigned to And if warriors couldn't transcend, there wouldn't be assigned to them such spiritual dimensions as hero and heroic life. Point is what they do upon transcendence. And there is the point of the ascetic, or the ascetic, who lives a unified life and exists outside the caste system like the pariah. But the former exists above it while the latter exists below it. Above the caste, there's a quote here, above the caste, being the ascetic, that becomes free from the, fr from the form by renouncing the illusory center of human individuality, he turns towards the principle from which every form proceeds, not by faithfulness to his own nature and participation in the hierarchy, but by direct action. If anything, this seems to be referring to the emperor of the world concept. Your own recent writings on that issue seems to collaborate that idea. Also, my old graph for the caste system and involutionary process. I'll be updating it sometime in the future, but it's good to have here as a potential discussion point as well. Involution. Okay, there's a graphic here.
first fall is the divine royalty, which is kings of spirit in the golden age. Second fall, warriors or kings of blood, silver age. Third fall, merchants, kings of coal, oil, iron, bronze age. Fourth fall, workers, kings of labor, iron age. On the side. I just can't read it that well. The print's pretty small here. So it's got... the traditions of each fall the the leaders of each tier on this pyramid and then on the side has the material castes or the world in terms of reality which are the which the third and fourth fall which are the merchants and workers and above that is the spiritual castes or the um, reality of warriors and then the super world which is still in the spiritual cast which makes up the divine royalty or the first fall the top of the pyramid of involution it goes into better detail about the traditions and the progress but I can't read it anyways there's a big block quote here what is most relevant in our day, today lives, and most relevant to the restoration of traditional civilization, is realizing what caste we belong to. After that, we can participate in using fascism as a means to restore tradition in Europe. The only thing I have to say relating to castes, in principle, is that Guanan's elite is essential, and that before it's even formed, its future members need to engage in their interior work to prepare themselves to lead the restoration. All of these articles on the principles of the traditional worldview are not only interesting but informative and essential to preparing oneself for the interior work. I would just like to see something on how people are applying esotericism, esotericism in, the, in their day-to-day -day lives because I certainly have hardly anything to offer." End quote by Panzer Tans. Back to Slavros. I'd say it works backwards to what you imply. We realize what our castes are by participating in the fascist struggle which puts us to the test, and we see where we excel and help the cause, and where we are useless. Like Corgianu said, the new elite is born from the struggle, but not just the elite is born. Everyone find their place in the castes. So rather than sitting and figuring out who you are in that regard, and only afterwards participating in the fascist struggle for restoring truth, we should just jump into the fight, and our utility, skills, and talents come through, and we fall into that role in the struggle and in the caste system. And Gwenon didn't come up with, it, with this, nor did Evola. They explained something that always existed in our worldview as one of its pillars, which is why it's essential. Not everyone can apply esotericism in their daily lives. Those of the lower castes can't directly engage esoteric forces like the highest castes can, nor enjoys some relation with those forces like the warrior caste. Lower castes engage with esoteric forces by mundane activity that fulfills them in their true nature, which is the default state for everyone in our ideal society. Upper castes just enjoy that and then some. Another quote here. I am unsure exactly what others have written, but from how I see it, man in himself is by default empty and will degenerate without anything higher. The spiritual king's source of spiritual fire is a divine source, the sun, which from they in turn create a structure of morals from. Eventually they degenerate and lose their connection to the sun, and the warriors take over with these morals as a base. Spiritual still, able to inspire the lower classes into being productive rather than destructive, Eventually this fire dies out from the warriors, and dead husks remain. See chivalry. The light of the sun turned into rays turns into shadow. The merchants take over and rule with laws, inspired by this shadow. Eventually the lower class get jealous and question them, eventually taking over, and even then the shadow disappears. The shit hits the fan. What I find a bit interesting, though, is that there almost seems to be a difference between the black sun and the sun. The sun representing something viral and constructive to create a new order, Helios, while the black sun seems to be viral and destructive to crush the degenerate one, Kalki, or am I mistaken somehow, by Noidberg. Fuck. 
I scrolled down and lost the damn page again. All right, Slavros's response. Depends on what you mean by man in himself in this instance, though I think where you're coming from, and it's presented in a quote in the chart above, the establishment of an objective and effect efficacious contact between them world equals material slash physical reality super world equals spiritual slash metaphysical reality was the presupposition of any higher form of civilization in life and as per the law that something great cannot come from something small there is the point of how great things can only degenerate into small things however when it comes to transcended people they don't rely on some external source because they have it internalized it's most likely it is the disappearance of these men that leads to the start of decay. And chivalry has a very particular meaning that today people don't know about, so it may not be a fitting example to your point. I myself don't know what's the exact origin of the black sun symbolism and how much the concept is associated with the black sun symbol. All I know is that in alchemy, the black sun is actually the material counterpart to the golden sun. Really? Okay. Quote here. There are at least a few examples of uh, kshatriya paths to enlightenment. The Bhagavad Gita is the best example, with Krishna laying out the path of Arjuna and describing several others. There is also Buddha, who was warrior caste. By Kursnik. Slavros's response. There are only two paths, if by enlightenment we mean transcendence the left and the right hand paths which appear in different names with different symbols and allegories but their actual nature remains the same for all of them and Siddhartha Gautama, Gautama was indeed a prince of the warrior caste and at the time the warrior caste was at odds with the sages caste because the latter had already experienced degeneration but when he became Buddha the awakened one he transcended, and his teachings are essentially the right-hand path to transcendence, although in my more recent readings I discovered that one of the phases to transcendence in the, teach in the teachings does have an alternative that is in its nature is reminiscent of the left-hand path. On the subject of vocations, while the four castes divide our general spiritual nature, in temporal affairs people of each caste enjoyed an array of vocations in a structure of corporatism, which has little to do with what we understand as corporatism today. Originally, originally, it was more like an existence of various guilds dedicated to a singular vocation, and each such guild had its own pantheons of heroes and a patron god. Their structure was militant, their relationship was that of an army, but their focus was in their vocation. The degenerate versions of this, world, of this would be labor unions. Quote here, Common activity provide a bond and an order same way as blood and ritual provided those for higher castes that didn't engage in such activities. The guilds, corporations, are like unions of vocation, as opposed to profession. It is people with a certain calling gathered together in an almost religious institution that worshipped the demon of their vocation and a cult of the dead and a cult of the dead, i.e. heroes of said vocation that represented the ideal bond between members of the given vocation cults of divine, legendary patrons of each, for each vocation. Another quote, Their members were bonded together for life, more as in a common right, than on the basis of the economic interests and mere productive goals. All right. Was that really... Oh, it, no. oh fucking hell, man. Okay. Alright, that, that ends that article. And this one here is the last of the chapter, so I'll try and knock it out as best I can. But I'm, man, after I hit that 20-30 minute mark, I'm pretty much worthless, I've found. And I think I'm pushing on 40 now. Um... Hopefully it's not so terrible that it's completely unlistenable. Otherwise, I might just end up breaking up these uh, recordings article by article, maybe. I mean, that helped, I, I thought, in uh, my recording of 
Mr. Jones's uh, Jewish fables. You know, the chapters are so short, you just do them one at a time, take a little break in between, and knock it out in just a day. And I, I felt as if those were my uh, best recordings, really. Anyways, final article of Chapter 2, Emperor of the World by Alexander Slavros. One of the roots, if not the root, from which stem so many differences between our worldview and the falsehoods out in the temporal world is the question of equality, as we all know by now. To quote an Ivan Alexandrovich Ilian, What does justice call for? Equality or inequality? Justice, that is to say, upholding the ultimate truth, demands inequality as per the nature of that truth, whereas our enemies believe in some form of equality, one way or another. We criticize the matter of equality extensively, and there is little to be said on it. However, we have tru never truly looked into the full extent of what we support, i.e. inequality. The great irony is that modern man craves freedom, and at the same time is scared of absolute power. So they demand equality, as if that is the path to freedom, and condemn fascists as totalitarian thugs who would take away all freedoms. It is ironic, because in their ideal world, they do not allow for freedom in its true form to exist at all, whereas our worldview upholds the only way freedom can actually exist. In the society of equals, one's rights end where, where another's begins. And today it's all about one's feelings. And so you have a multitude of separate, atomic individuals living in mutual confinement and restraint. When everyone are packed together like sardines, nobody can flex their shoulders without bumping someone else's shoulder, or even jab them one in the uh, one in the eye, or even jab them one in the eye. Inequality. Inequality. Everyone are slaves to each other. Our ideal for the temporal society is the imperium, empire in the true sense of the word, where freedom can exist because there is inequality and thus a hierarchy. Nobody is as free as the one world view, as always intertwined or rooted in spirit. This is where the understanding of might makes right gets its true validity. Oh god, did I just fuck up again? I think I did. Our ideal for the temporal society is the Imperium. Empire in the true sense of the word, where freedom can exist because there is inequality and thus a hierarchy. Nobody is as free as the one who holds absolute power. For only one can be truly free and thus embody freedom. In inequality, one becomes freedom itself. This is the emperor of the world, universal ruler. This is a visible reminder of the image of the universal ruler. Kakravar Artin, an expression that literally means the spinner of the wheel, in reference to him who, as an immobile center, moves the wheel of the regnum and of the ordered universe. I highly recommend reading Evola's Hedon and Imperialism chapters dedicated to this subject matter, as they are easily comprehensible and have a propagandish flair to them that will make them more enjoyable for the broader audience as opposed to, the, to other Evola texts. True liberalism and hierarchy through might conquering the state. Thus the empire, hierarchy, and freedom are inherently entangled together, with the emperor at the center of it all. Here we must bring some distinction between a temporal leader and the emperor of the world. A temporal leader, a temporal ruler, can only aspire to titles such as the first son or first servant of their respective nation and empire. Their rule is more so temporal. However, the emperor of the world is something that goes far beyond temporal matters, as he holds both temporal and spiritual power. With my previous topics in mind, it should be self-evident that the emperor of the world absolutely must be someone who had achieved transcendence, which thus imparts to him the power to rule in both physical and metaphysical aspects of life. This is essentially a god on earth. I mentioned in previous writings how today someone to... In previous writings, how today, someone to have achieved transcendence, a man above time, 
is more likely to walk over temporal affairs than engage in them. And I also mentioned that should a temporal manif manifestation of our worldview arise, that such men would be more likely to become involved in temporal affairs. The emperor of the world is someone who'd not simply rule one society or nation, but the entire world, and thus any temporal ruler would be his servant as well. Emperor of the world is identified by his might, which in our worldview is always intertwined or rooted in spirit. This is where the understanding of might makes right gets its true validity, not when might is interpreted exclusively in material means, but when it is firstly identified with spirit. But otherwise, the same principles apply. Who will get to flex his shoulders in a packed can of sardines? Whoever imposes his will to do so onto others and his freedom will be defined by how much elbow room he made for himself. If someone manages to stop him and fight for his own space, even if limited, then the two come to a point of conflict where either they will be at a standstill and thus become mutual slaves, or one will dominate totally and thus prove himself to be the only truly free entity. This is how hierarchies are indeed formed. Some still live with little elbow room. Others have a bit more, but only one may walk around and push others out of his path and have it all. Of course, this is more akin to how the modern man would see a hierarchy, through the notion of oppression and such, in other words, as someone displeased with their rightful place. In reality, the existence of the one truly free person gives organic order to society and helps everyone find their true place and thus achieve happiness and direction. In the past, there were most likely many candidates for becoming the emperor of the world, but the world was larger and they most likely never had their elbows brushed against one another, and thus the role was never fulfilled to its true extent. Today, our world is that much smaller and now... Today our world is that much smaller, and now such a thing as a god on earth may become reality in the coming of the emperor of the world, one whose supremacy is the basis for his might, and not his might as the basis for his supremacy, which is the character of a mere temporal ruler. I've mentioned how man above time internalizes everything within until he is nation itself, race itself, and so on. Emperor of the world is that but he is also someone who manifests metaf metaphysical law into temporal law and is thus the empire itself, the state itself, the only one who may say, I am the path, I am truth, I am life. Not to mention that many can aspire to transcendence through, though few have the inherent capacity for it, destiny in the Francis Parker Yaki sense of the word, but nobody can aspire to become emperor of the world as it is something exclusive to one, the one, here I am bringing in a bit of my own speculation together with what I read from Evola. You can look into this more via his book, Mysteries of the Grail. The coming of the emperor of the world can only happen once he is awakened from slumber, finds a new manifestation in human form, an avatar, or given a kingdom to return to, when the withered tree of the empire blossoms again. This is something that is covered extensively in the book mentioned via various myths from all over with primar primary importance given to the myths of the grail. What I have given thought to was an allegory of the Lord Regent, someone who rules in the absence of the emperor of the world, which is really but a temporal ruler, or perhaps even lesser transcendent ruler, though such a scenario is less likely for reasons I mentioned already in the past. Here is the allegory. The king is gone, asleep, wounded, or disappeared, and the scoundrels staged a coup and taken the kingdom. Involution, rebellion of the slaves, establishment of equality, rise of the modern world. But there are still those loyal, the invisible army, the modern representation of which are fascists, to the crown, truth, or worldview. To rally those loyal to the king beneath his banner and take the kingdom back in his name must come a lord regent, a man against time kind of leader. Think to any fascist leader like Hitler, Mussolini, Mosley, Cordrianu, and etc., and you see in them that regent regardless if they lead a state or a movement. Because for a king to come back, he needs a kingdom to come back to. Our struggle to usher, usher in a temporal manifest of our worldview. Upon his return, these regents become part of, this, of the hierarchy underneath him, ruling as temporal leaders on his behalf as first servants of their respective nations. The purpose of this article was in showing the extent to which inequality is one of the root concepts we support. It's a notion that may still be overwhelming for most, novices especially, 
but we don't often give it thought and just bash away at equality, which is good, but the above shows you the full extent of our worldview, with that aspect of it followed to its logical, logical conclusion, and thus once more gives a more rounded understanding of what we fight for. That concludes the second chapter and this recording.